ZDDP is on death's doorstep. The world's most popular additive has been in widespread use since the 1940s in engine oil applications, in industrial applications, as well as mobile hydraulics. So what exactly does it do? Well, first of all, let's go back to our friend, the Strybeck curve, which described all our lubrication regimes. If you remember, there's three different types of lubrication. We've got boundary, as well as mixed, and hydrodynamic lubrication. In the boundary and mixed lubrication regime, where we have metal-to-metal -metal contact, what we need is anti-wear additives. And ZDDP, or sometimes called ZDTP, or zinc dioxyl diphosphate, has been the most popular additive for a very, very long time. It's primarily made of two components. You mix 5-phosphoric acid and you neutralize it with a zinc oxide. This is effectively an acid-base reaction, which produces zinc dioxyl diphosphate. You obviously remove the water and you're left with a simple anti-wear additive. When these additives get added into a load zone, they tend to decompose and they form surface films. And that's really how they perform their anti-wear functionality. These surface films, as they develop, are then forming sacrificial films with very, very thin layers, which then prevent the metals from coming into contact with each other. It's also quite clever in that if the load increases, there are cross links made in the ZDTP film, which make the film tougher. So effectively, as the load goes up, this anti-wear film toughens up and gets stronger. And it's almost like a, a clever film as conditions get tougher, it actually gets tougher itself. Um, and so what you're doing when the two rough surfaces are, mo are moving against each other, you're not wearing away the metal surfaces, you're wearing away these tribofilms. And there's enough um, ZDTP in the lubricant that these tribofilms can continuously be regenerated, certainly over the period of an order and interval. ZDDP has another party trick up its sleeve, which is that not only is it an anti-wear additive, it also acts as an antioxidant, specifically as what we call a peroxide decomposer. So that ROOH that you see in the middle contributes to the oxidation cycle. ZDDP actually interacts with these peroxides and decomposes them into more inert components, which don't catalyze even further oxidation. So we get a lot of bang for buck out of a single molecule that's relatively cheap to produce. Now, because it's produced in such vast quantities, we've also got an economies of scale, and that makes moving away from ZDDP a bit of a challenge. But the beginning of the end for ZDDP really started back in 1970. It was governments around the world that started putting in emissions criteria, specifically the US Clean Air Act in the 1970s really got things kicked off, which targeted emissions, but specifically emissions from the back of vehicles. In order to achieve the criteria, we needed to look at using catalysts, specifically exhaust catalysts. Now, the whole point of these is that they use these rare earth stabilizers to convert harmful emissions like NOx and carbon monoxide into more inert gases like nitrogen or carbon dioxide. We tend to think of carbon dioxide as being the enemy these days, but back in the day, carbon dioxide was a much friendlier option than carbon monoxide, which is terribly toxic. The key bit of the construction of these catalysts is to maximize the surface contact between the exhaust gas and these rare earth stabilizers. That's what enables most of the emissions to be converted. So the whole point of that structure is to maximize the catalyst surface area. This is where ZDDP starts to fall down. What makes it such a good anti-wear additive is the fact that it contains both sulfur and phosphorus, which have an affinity for metal surfaces. Unfortunately, if we have any ZDDP in our exhaust, that means it's going to want to coat the different surfaces. And as a result, if we have exhaust gases trying to make contact with these metals, they're unable to do so. And this is a process that is known as catalyst fouling. If you look into the catalyst and you trace back where the exhaust gases come from, really sulfur and phosphorus can come from only one of three places. What goes into an engine? It's fuel, air, and oil. Now, Fuel and oil are both sources of sulfur. Fuel, for example, can contain a lot of sulfur, particularly in diesel. But the move to ultra-low sulfur diesels means that we're minimizing the amount of sulfur that's in the system. With oil, we have both sulfur as well as phosphorus as a result of the additives. Now, it's not just ZDDP which is to blame. 
Other elements like molybdenum dithiocarbamate also contain sulfur and phosphorus. But ultimately, what this is leading to is a reduction in sulfur and phosphorus levels, particularly from a regulation standpoint. So if you look at the ACSC category, for example, they specify how much sulfur and phosphorus you are allowed to have in your formulation. It gets even worse for ZDDP. Because when you look at industrial lubricants, specifically the gear oils, you can see why we're starting to get away from formulations that contain ZDDP. So way back in the day, what we tended to do when we wanted to formulate, let's say, for example, an automotive gear oil, is we tended to take an engine oil and then just cut back the additive package. That's where you get this term, cut back engine oils. This wasn't just true of gear oils, it was also true of hydraulic oils. It took a little bit of a rethink on how we formulate industrial lubricants. These days, industrial lubricants tend to be much less additized than their automotive cousins. And so when you look at industrial versus, let's say, for example, automotive gear oil in formulations, you'll tend to find that they have a lot less additives and particularly a lot less metal containing additives because the metal containing additives tend to hold onto quite a lot of water. There is another trend which is contributing to the end of the zinc age, and that's really increased power densities in both mobile hydraulics as well as in, for example, plastic injection molding. What we're seeing here is that more power delivered through smaller packages and smaller oil sumps is delivering higher oil temperatures. And what we're starting to see is potentially some thermal degradation of the ZDDP molecule, which seems to fall apart around that 110 to 120 degrees Celsius. Now, I can't point exactly to the science of how this works, but from the trending that I've seen, under very, very high temperatures, the ZDDP molecule falls apart. And when I look at trends of used oil analysis results, what tends to happen is a characteristic uh, pattern. What we tend to see when you look at the used oil analysis results is iron slowly comes up, and then as the anti-wear film forms, it starts to drop. But then we have, correspondingly, a rapid depletion of zinc. The thing about that rapid depletion is that it doesn't match the depletion of phosphorus, which stays relatively flat. The problem with thermal degradation of ZDDP is it often contributes to hydraulic oil sludge. This can be a problem in closed tolerance servo valves, for example, where they start to get stuck when there's too much sludge and varnish. When you actually look at the sludge, and you do an analysis of it, it tends to contain a lot of zinc, but very little phosphorus, which is an indication that the molecule itself is starting to break down. When you put all these factors together, it might mean that the age of zinc is coming to a close. Now, that might not be anytime soon. I'm sure ZDDP is gonna be around for the next 10, 20 to 30 years, but we'll start to see it eliminated from many, many formulations. It'll be a sad day once it goes, but there's always a better technology out there. This is actually a video version of an article that I wrote for Precision Lubrication Magazine, which comes out in December of 2022. It's a new publication, which is looking to provide in-depth news as well as insights on lubrication, maintenance, and reliability. I've actually been asked to be on the editorial advisory board, so it's really exciting. And the reason why I came on board is because the contributors are a really, really high quality. In fact, if you've been a fan of the podcast, you'll see a few familiar faces. It's a digital only, but completely free magazine packed with insights. So I really encourage you to sign up. So Precision Lubrication Magazine, get on it.